over the line. Good man. Wow. Great way to end the session on a big Chinook salmon. Let's put it back. Down he goes. <laughs> Wicked. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Fishing with Rod. We're not going to be doing too much fishing in this video, but I hope you still find the information being presented in this video quite interesting. Now, recently I attended a symposium hosted by Dr. Scott Hinge at the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Lab at UBC. Now, this symposium has been happening for the last 15 years and um, it involves having Dr. Hinch's uh, graduate students uh, presenting their researches and findings to fellow students, colleagues, and uh, stakeholders such as myself in the sport fishing community. Now, as a fellow uh, UBC fishery biology graduate, I usually find this information quite interesting. And, uh, and I'm gonna point out one particular presentation in this video which I think many of you will find quite fascinating as well. Now the presentation is done by Steve Johnson, who's a avid angler as well. And uh, his study is on the mortality of Chinook salmon when it comes to catching and releasing them in salt water around BC. As you know, in the past couple of years, uh, many Fraser River Chinook salmon stocks have been listed as endangered now. And as a result, um, the anglers and other fishing sectors have been facing numerous closures and other limitations when it comes to retention of uh, Chinook salmon as well. Now, mandatory catch and release is a management measure that can be used when it comes to selective fisheries, meaning that we can only keep fish from healthy stocks and um, releasing fish from endangered stock. Now, catch and release can only work if majority of the salmon that would release will survive and go on to spawn successfully in the natal stream. So it's really important to gather as much information as we can to figure out the survival of these fish and uh, if there are better releasing strategies, release methodologies that we can use to improve um, their survival and to keep these resources sustainable. And that's where Steve's studies come in. So he looks at the survival of released Chinook salmon by tagging them and tracking their migration and behavior, and more importantly, the survival rate. And uh, he also looks at the, the different uh, fishing gear used, how they impact the survival, and how natural injuries on the fish uh, impact the survival of the fish once they are caught and released. Um, I won't talk too much about the study, um, the presentation is about 15 minutes long. You should definitely watch through that. Okay, so one last thing before we go. So by showing you this video, I hope to achieve a couple of things. So one is to connect the scientific community and the sport fishing community because there's so much research going on behind the scene when it comes to salmon conservation. And Dr. Scott Hinge and his students have done amazing work in the past couple of decades. They have contributed so much valuable information um, for the BC salmon fisheries. So, and second thing is, is that by showing you this video, I hope to inspire some of the younger viewers to show you that besides fishing, um, there's many more opportunities out there in salmon research, in fishery research, like what Steve's doing. So he can go on to do study in this um, field and uh, help our fish uh, for the future and for our kids as well. So I won't say too much more about it. Um, the presentation itself is about 15 minutes long. Um, if you have any other questions regarding this study, or if you have any feedbacks, ideas, please leave them in the comment. Um, either myself or Steve will get back to you for sure. And uh, thank you for watching. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel for many more videos like this. Until next time, good luck fishing. So to begin, uh, there are many groups, many individuals that I'd really like to thank. Uh, of course, the funders, the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, uh, as well as many others that provided support just uh, through provision of vessels, uh, gear, 
uh, helping with our field sampling as well as technical expertise uh, and advising on industry standards that are used within these fisheries. Uh, to begin, I'm going to talk today about a little bit about the why, why we're completing this work, uh, then get into what we hope to achieve from these studies uh, and, and how we hope to uh, uh, complete our goals and, and meet our goals. And then dive into some of our preliminary results uh, from our first full season in, in 2020. Uh, and then touch on where we, where we aim to move uh, in the future here going forward. And last but not least, I really wanna turn this over to you in the discussion period and really help uh, get some guidance from you on, on what, where we can improve and, and how we can take this project moving forward. So to step back, the, uh, the focus of the study is uh, the Chinook salmon, like all Pacific salmon. Uh, they're an anadromous species that are born in freshwater environments, migrate to sea and return to their natal rivers to spawn. They're the largest and uh, least abundant of all Pacific salmon species. And they also represent the uh, most complex life histories among them with variable freshwater residence periods, variable marine residence periods, and the most diverse range of timing to the rivers. And this was really important uh, when we consider uh, the First Nations fisheries that targeted these uh, individuals for millennia. Uh, they were abundant throughout the majority of the Fraser and its tributaries and many coastal streams and watersheds as well. And with that early run timing, they, uh, they, they began running in the rivers long before other species of salmon. Uh, and they were available early in that se season, meaning they brought uh, the important nutrients uh, and, and food uh, back to these peoples, uh, not only along the coast, but thousands of kilometers inland uh, on rivers like the Fraser, the, the Columbia and the, and the Skeena watersheds. But today we're, we're focusing the discussion on, on recreational fisheries and marine rec recreational fisheries really took hold on the Pacific coast in the late 1800s and was primarily centered on the large body Chinook returning to the Campbell River. Uh, that fishery occurred in the estuary and uh, in, a, in a location locally known as the Taiyi Pool. And many people heard the tales of, of the fisheries and, and flocked to, to British Columbia to uh, partake in, in these activities. And Chinook fisheries really became uh, a, a social foundation for uh, many communities, many coastal communities, and many riverine communities in British Columbia. Today, Things have definitely evolved. Uh, gone are the uh, rowboats of the 1890s, uh, aside from the Taiyi pool uh, today. We have uh, very high participation, over 3,000 licenses sold uh, every year on the Pacific coast. And uh, the majority are local anglers, but still many people from around the world come to uh, partake in this fishery. Catch and release um, uh, began to really, uh, in terms of a conservation effort, began uh, in some guiding communities uh, within the, in the mid 2000s uh, in locations where large bodied Chinook were, were still highly abundant. Uh, the guides here recognized the declines in these large fish and, and thought if they could release these fish, they would, they would go on to survive. Uh, so this was a social directive that's, uh, that's now uh, not born from these fisheries, but uh, is really uh, taken off globally through a, uh, uh, a social media campaign called Keep Them Wet, or now, now known as Keep Fish Wet. This is a global campaign that's really um, not only promoting catch and release uh, in fisheries, but more importantly, promoting the correct catch and release methods in these recreational fisheries. However, the social directives are not the only driver for catch and release. Fisheries management has now stepped in and regulated the release of Chinook at various times in various regions. Uh, this mandated catch and release fishery was first observed in, in marine fisheries in 1996 on the northern coast of BC and was again implemented in 2019 and 2020. Uh, in 2019, both on the north and south coast and uh, in a more strict sense in 2020 in the Salish Sea here. Uh, specifically, um, to, uh, specifically in response to the declining Chinook productivity uh, on the Fraser River system 
and also uh, in response to the big bar landslide. So I think we're all aware uh, some of the very important populations that are in a, in a truly scary decline uh, in the Fraser especially, but fisheries managers now have uh, the somewhat unfortunate task of, of ideally managing fisheries, but with somehow without closures. Uh, because many communities on the coast now rely on the economic stimulus that this recreational tourism provides. And many communities rely on this for their social connection to both the people and the place where they angle. So catch and release is one of those management regulations that are aimed at providing this protection of the stocks. However, some questions remain. Can we uh, follow DFO's selective fishing policy guidelines and, and release these individuals alive and unharmed? And plainly, we want to understand, does catch and release actually work? Can we release these fish and do they survive well enough to get back and spawn? And to understand if it works, we need to know what's causing the mortality. So this brings, up, brings us to the concept of, of fisheries related incidental mortality. Now FRIM uh, is a relatively new uh, construct developed within DFO, first published in David Patterson's 2017 paper. And it includes things like uh, non-capture mortality as well as kept catch. Non-capture includes avoidance uh, mortality, simply avoiding gear, uh, drop off or depredation mortality, and even individuals that escape from gear but still experience injury leading to mortality. As well as what the talk will uh, center around today uh, is post-release mortality. Uh, what Patterson and Elf uh, found in their review paper was that really a lot of the research surrounding this post-release mortality was quite limited in its, its ability uh, to, to have a true control within the research, um, limited in its realism, uh, its relatedness to the actual fishery, and the mortality response time was actually quite often short, um, 24 hour, 48 hour holding periods uh, to test this mortality, which of course, we all know isn't does not relate to a, a Chinook migration in, in a natural environment. So this leaves some very uh, significant questions to be answered in regards to post-release mortality. Uh, and first and foremost, what's what's causing this mortality? Well, we know uh, there's a few factors uh, that contribute in recreational fisheries. Uh, through Patterson's review, uh, we see that uh, simply the the capture stress. Uh, involved in the hooking and fighting and landing of a fish. These uh, longer exhaustive ex ex exercises lead to a potential increase in mortality. We know that handling can increase mortality. Of course, handling in air, air exposure to, to remove hooks, uh, maybe to take pictures. We know this is linked to mortality. Um, slightly more surprising for some, handling in water, even the ventilation assistance that we may try to provide these fish might actually be causing uh, increases in mortality. Uh, things like injuries to uh, the gill tissue, uh, to the eyes, uh, specific locations in the jaw may cause more, uh, may cause more mortality post-release. As well, everyone's favorite uh, seal out there while they're fishing, we know predators can actually lead to this as well, both during the fighting event and after the fighting event in a release scenario. And lastly, water temperature, uh, most notably its additive impact uh, and often lethal effects on uh, upstream migrations. So this leads us to our objectives for the, our uh, BC Swift catch and release uh, study. Uh, first and foremost, we, we aim to generate measures of post-release mortality and link this to fish condition and handling practices, looking for clues uh, as what, what might be causing more of that mortality to occur within the angling experience. We hope to provide some validation to various fishing techniques, uh, new tools uh, that might be used to reduce this handling stress uh, in scenarios where handling must occur. And through our work with Dr. Christy Miller's lab, uh, we aim to investigate some of the sublethal and pathogen effects that may be uh, adding to mortality post-release. And lastly, but likely most importantly, we'll, we'll develop a science-based best practices guidebook for anglers to learn how best to handle their catch uh, when they're intending to release these individuals. That'll be both for 
uh, longtime anglers uh, as well as uh, angler, new anglers to, uh, to the sport. Today, I'll be focusing my talk on our, our first objective here and with, with the uh, idea that all of this, everything we learn over the coming years and previous years of study will be fed into our, our final objective here. So these are obviously very big questions. And luckily, uh, this, we have a really big study system that we can we use to uh, help us understand this. So the map here on the right hand side of the screen is of course showing the Southwest Vancouver Island and the Salish Sea. And you'll see the yellow dots there represent various receivers stationed throughout the Salish Sea in the, the west coast of Vancouver Island. At present, we have three separate regions of study uh, that, that we are focusing on. The first, uh, the Discovery Islands where Chinook catch and release as well as Chinook ecology will be uh, the main focus of the study. Second, uh, the Juan de Fuca Strait, I spoke about this last year, uh, some of our preliminary work in that region, uh, but this is also where our coho program was taking place uh, and the Chinook are being tagged there as well in 2020 or were tagged there in 2020. Uh, but this is more of a, with, with an eye to the, the ecological understanding of those individuals. And last but not least, uh, in the coming summers, we'll be moving into uh, the Barkley Sound, Alberni Canal and the Somas River system where the study will continue to look at catch and release mortality impacts, but also focus a little bit on climate change and, and warming waters. For those of you unaccustomed with acoustic telemetry, this is a tag technology um, that involves, uh, that, well, that allows us to track fish uh, in the marine environment or any submarine environment. The arrays consist uh, of individual receivers that are stationed along the seafloor um, across migration paths where we expect these individuals to go. Each tag has a unique ID code so we can actually track the individual at, a, at an individual bait at an individual level uh, and a detection gives us a time and position. Um, that allows us to uh, both monitor survival, how far are these fish progressing along their expected migration and just simply understanding their movement patterns. Just a really quick side note here. Um, I'd really like to highlight the collaborative effort that's occurring with, uh, with this group. We have um, cross-border federal research agencies uh, and other uh, Canadian research agencies like Contama and the Ocean Tracking Network, as well as a couple of universities that we're, we're all working together. We're all sharing data. Um, and it's just a pretty remarkable group to be working with right now. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So we're going to zoom in now, uh, moving north uh, to our Discovery Islands uh, segment of uh, our study site. Uh, we have a large uh, number of arrays uh, within this region that are actually specifically designed to study survival. Um, uh, the density and the number of these arrays and the, and the locations that were chosen for the, these arrays allow us to uh, test survival of fish uh, if they are caught within uh, this region uh, in the northeast component of that. And that's exactly what we did. We were lucky enough to get into this region early in the summer of, of 2020 and uh, ca captured and tagged 179 Chinook among these seven different locations. And when we pair that with uh, genetic stock ID, uh, we know where these individuals are supposed to go. And we know through our telemetry results if they've made it there. Uh, and, and the eventual success of their migration to where, where they need to be. So now we know where this is happening. Let's get into how it's happening. Again, I want to remind you, one of the overarching objectives for our work is simply realism. We need to match uh, the fishery that's occurring as closely as possible. As Patterson pointed out in his paper, this was highly lacking from the majority of the research that's happened previously. Um, so we wanted to mimic public anglers as much as possible. And, and that just simply meant going out and recreationally fishing using the same methods, same hooks, gears, uh, same rods, reels, and the, and the handling methods that occurred. One of those handling methods is uh, an air exposure event. You'll notice these two fish are behaving relatively differently on, uh, in the air exposure treatment. Uh, so we do see a range we also had a range of air exposure groups that was from 30 seconds all the way up to 120 seconds. 
but we also had a group of individuals, 50 individuals that uh, experienced no air exposure and went directly uh, from uh, landing in a net into our, uh, into our sampling trough. And this was to simulate the process of landing a fish, removing the hook, uh, taking a, a photograph, something like that, just, which is something that commonly occurs in the fishery today. I apologize for anyone that has some poor Wi-Fi, but it's just a video to show some of the processes that we go through. And, and like many recreational anglers will know, it all starts with staring blankly at rods for too many hours in a day. But again, this was part of the realism of, of the work that we wanted to do. But once the fish is on board, we place them in a trough here that you can see fully submerged. We complete um, a reflex assessment, a physical assessment. We collect biological data, just the fork length, uh, the girth of the individual, uh, as well as a fat probe measurement you'll see here shortly. This gives us a measure of the relative energy density of the fish. Uh, then we move into our tagging process. The tags are attached behind the dorsal fin in uh, a method called backpack tagging. So this uses a spaghetti tag filled with 40 pound monofilament and a, a stainless steel crimp uh, to ensure that these tags don't go anywhere. Um, Brian wraps things up with a nice little knot on the very end just to ensure uh, there's no slippage and, and loss of that tag. We can see uh, Brian then samples scales uh, from just behind the dorsal fin for aging purposes. Uh, takes a tissue sample from the adipose fin uh, or caudal fin if it was a hatchery fish. And we finish everything up with a gill biopsy sample uh, before then uh, releasing the fish to uh, continue on its merry way and tell us all about its life. And for those of you uh, that had poor Wi-Fi, I apologize. I'll quickly go through this with, just with some pictures. You can see uh, the trough on the right hand side there where we completed our reflex and physical assessments. We took our, our length measurements, our, our fat measurements, our tissue samples for aging uh, or, sorry, scale samples for aging, our, our tissue samples for stock ID and our gill biopsy for condition and pathogen presence uh, detection. Uh, and then the tag was attached just behind the dorsal fin as you see here in this last photo and they were released. So our tagging uh, was completed from June 2nd to the 13th. We uh, captured, we, we interacted with nearly 355 Chinook uh, we landed approximately 280. Um, however, we only tagged 179. Uh, the, the majority of the fish that we, we released were simply on the smaller end of the scale and we wanted to broaden our, our size distribution to the, the larger, uh, to the larger end of things as well. Uh, the fork lengths ranged from 59 to 99 centimeters and weight ranged from about 1.8 or four pounds, uh, as you can see, the smaller individual was about a four pound Chinook and this larger one was about a 30 pound Chinook. You can see the relative size among those individuals that we captured. The populations we interacted with in the Discovery Islands were dominated by these Puntledge and Qualcomm fish. Uh, as you can see the, the histogram here and showing the, the abundances. Um, the Squamish tributary fish, the Chequamus and Mamquam, and the Fraser, lower Fraser tributary fish really rounded out the, uh, the groups that showed up in the population groups that showed up in, in higher abundances. Of course, we had a very short tagging window only from the second to the 13th. So uh, there's not a lot of variation of when these populations were migrating through the area, uh, but you can see the, the vast majority of them were there the whole time. So we know handling uh, has an impact on fisheries survival uh, and among various fisheries se sectors, the, the recreational angling generally has the lowest handling times as the interaction is, is, is generally uh, immediately dealt with. Uh, that's the fun of recreational fishing. But, and we can see our handling time here, our, our middle plot uh, ranges from about three to 12 minutes and our fight time uh, from about uh, one to 11 minutes. Now this handling time is uh, composed of transfer time. So the time it takes to move a fish between the boats um, and our, our actual tagging, our scientific tagging time. And for an overall encounter time of about five uh, to, to 18 minutes. Now this is generally longer uh, than a typical interaction time. 
due to our, our scientific processes. Um, but if you ask many anglers uh, what an average interaction time is, uh, I would actually hazard a guess that it would fall somewhere within this encounter time. Um, and as we've begun to realize through our work now, this, uh, this is actually a commonly mis uh, commonly held misconception among anglers that fight times are, are actually a lot longer than they truly are. Uh, but as many of us know, fishermen lie about a lot of things, especially the size of their fish. So it's not really all that surprising that they lie about this as well. Um, getting in some of the observations uh, that, that, we, that we've collected during our time. So we RAMP, uh, I've alluded to, is, is a reflex assessment, a reflex action mortality predictor. Now, this has been shown in, in previous work, notably here in, in Graham Raby's work published in 2012. Um, these RAMP scores, a, a lower RAMP score uh, was associated with quite high survival and increases in RAMP uh, lead to decreases in survival. And as we can see here, uh, our air exposure treatment actually led to a uh, an increase in ramp scores overall. Now it's not, uh, we don't see that across all the fish. Of course, we see a number of individuals in our control group still expressing these, these higher ramp scores, but uh, there's definitely something going on here with this air exposure experience. As I said, we collected a fat probe uh, measurement. This gives us a relative energy density to, of these fish. Uh, we know it's linked with population and it's very likely linked with maturity, which we can look at with our uh, scale samples and aging. And we collected our gill biopsies um, uh, in hopes to observe uh, the condition of these fish that we, we don't, we are unable to see uh, uh, while we're handling them on the boat. Uh, we can use this to provide some uh, clues as to what diseases might be uh, or how disease might be related to mortality and also look for components of that natural mortality that occurs um, uh, with these fish uh, at, a, at a genomic level. And I'll hopefully be discussing a lot more of this next year uh, once we begin to analyze these samples. Some of the capture data we collected, simply the depth of capture, the various gear types that we used. Uh, our hooks ranged uh, pretty standard uh, use within the recreational fisheries from three aught to seven aught. Uh, we collected information on the various hook locations and the proportions uh, of, of, of hooks that were located there. Uh, and this is all with, uh, in light to uh, looking for um, patterns in this that, that may be leading to more mortality uh, in, in terms of gears. One of the thoughts is, is uh, are flashers good or bad? They're, they generally lead to a, a more intense fight, but this is often over a shorter period of time compared to uh, a non-flasher uh, uh, capture event. Uh, some of the injuries we observed, you can see our sampling trough here full of blood and scales. The scales uh, were from our air exposure event as they, as they uh, thrashed around on the, on the bottom of the boat, uh, blood from, from the hooking wound. Um, we saw hooking wounds ranging from uh, fairly severe eye injuries to extremely severe eye injuries where a complete rupture had occurred uh, to something quite minor. Uh, you can see just a little bit of blood pooling in the eye there. And, uh, as a recreational angler, you might not notice this uh, when you're releasing this individual, but uh, this, we, this did present itself uh, as we continued our sampling in the trough over time. Some uh, torn uh, percolant or torn jaws uh, of these individuals causing a, a fairly significant amount of bleeding. Uh, natural tears to the fin, as well as unnatural tears to the fin. Now this is a quote unquote release uh, quality net uh, simply because of the, uh, the, the coated material. However, when we consider the actual fine gauge of this, of this material, it's been, uh, we can see here, cutting through uh, uh, nearly every Chinook that we handled, uh, cutting through their fins and causing this damage, which uh, previous work has shown uh, can be quite related with uh, survival. Some natural, uh, natural injuries that were occurring, predator wounds, something quite minor, like minor and healed over that you're seeing here. Something a little, little so, so more severe with a, a bit of healing and, and some that are actually very fresh uh, as the individual you see here. 
uh, obviously a predator of some type. We can see the, the teeth uh, above, the, above the gash. Uh, but this, this fish was actually successful uh, in migrating back to its, its home river in the Seuss Creek in Puget Sound. Uh, and we actually uh, had this fish recovered in the hatchery there. In terms of fisheries uh, inflicted injuries, 6% uh, uh, of, of our sample, uh, we, we saw actually previous encounter wounds. The, the individual you see on the right hand side here, we provided this uh, newly um, inflicted eye wound here. Uh, but in the, in the top panel, you can see this is actually a healed over scar, some bruising around the eye and, and actually some, some damage to the eye here, it appears. Uh, from, a, from an encounter prior to our handling. Speaking of eye injuries, we had 27% of our fish uh, that, that we inflicted a new fisheries wound to their eye. Uh, and this does appear to be related to um, hook size. 49% uh, of our fish that were hooked with either six or seven, those larger size classes of hooks, uh, experienced eye injury compared to our Smaller hook classes, uh, only 17% uh, uh, cause damage to the eye. Now, uh, virtually all of the fish have some level of bleeding occurring. We're, we're creating a puncture wound into their jaw and, and we would often see just a slight ooze of blood out of wounds like that. However, 22% of our sample expressed uh, what we were classifying as a notable bleed, something that was uh, more severe or pulsing and, and the significant bleeds you see here, um, uh, 12 of our, of our 40 that were bleeding uh, actually were uh, severe or sig uh, arterial in, in nature. We were watching pulsing blood coming out of the gill um, uh, while these fish were in our trough. Some of the first data we, we get back uh, during the summer is, is from recapture events. And, uh, we had 14 fish of our sample recovered in, in recreational fisheries. Uh, these dates ranged from June 26th to September 9th, and an additional 17 that were recovered in hatcheries uh, ranging from August 21st down south in uh, the Puget Sound, uh, and then all the way up to October 26th in the uh, Puntledge River here. During these recaptures, we're actually pretty lucky to receive some images uh, from individuals that, that recapture these fish. And this, uh, uh, these, these occurred in recreational fisheries, as you see here, uh, in First Nations fisheries. Uh, and as well, we get pictures of our tags, which is really great. Uh, we can see how, how these tags are holding up over time in the, in the dorsal tissue of these fish. This one on the right is a, is a relatively uh, uh, new tag, only weeks after our release. Whereas this one here on the left-hand side, this was three months, <clears throat> pardon me, three months after our tagging event. Uh, and highlight on this one, uh, it, was, it was flagged for us on a uh, Facebook group. And according to Facebook, uh, we, we really suck at our job and, uh, and these tags are, are really cheap apparently. So yeah, hopefully those Facebook people can buy us some more tags. Uh, and I really wanna highlight one fish here, it's just, to me, I was very interested in this individual. It was caught June 6th. It's fork length, weight, relative fat. We're all in the bottom 10% of our, our sample. It's, its ramp score was a three. So you'll remember that higher ramp equals poor mortality. Um, and it had air exposure of 50 seconds. So overall, uh, not a very healthy looking fish. Uh, especially when we consider on June 6th, when we caught it, uh, we left it a nice, uh, a nice gaping wound on the side of its face. Um, and when we consider on the same day of our capture, we can see it, it, it has a, a previous fisheries interaction wound here, the slight, slight wound there and some uh, bruising around the jaw. Well, it was detected June 16th uh, in our, uh, our array in between Quadra and Cortez Island. And then it was, recaptured uh, by another fisherman on July 17th. You'll recognize the, uh, the little joker smile here on this face. Um, it was then uh, recovered uh, 137 days after our initial release in the uh, little Qualcomm hatchery. And, and again, this is great. We can see, uh, again, some wounding around the, uh, the tag implantation, a little bit of wear and tear behind the tag. So. 
um, maybe we can uh, work on some ways to reduce uh, this type of uh, 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 impact. Now, uh, getting into some of our telemetry results, um, we're looking at uh, uh, a rate of travel from our, our release to our first detection. And this occurred in our uh, three arrays here that you see again, just to remind you, these blue circles represent our points of release and these yellow circles represent our receiver arrays, uh, specifically in discovery passage, subtle channel and desolation sound. Uh, this plot uh, shows the migration rate uh, of Chinook moving from their point of capture to the various arrays. And among all the, the Chinook, the mean travel rate was actually only about uh, three and a half kilometers per day, which obviously they're not moving in this uh, to these arrays in a direct line of travel. There's a lot of residence that occurs within this region, so this is relatively slow. Uh, but you'll notice the majority of Chinook uh, migrated using desolation sound. Uh, that is primarily driven because the majority of our capture was over here uh, in near Toba Inlet. But we do see the, 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 the highest uh, number of, or the greatest uh, number of, of stocks occurring here uh, and a little bit more variability in their, in their run timing. This is potentially caused by uh, fish simply needing to transit the area uh, at, a, at a slightly higher rate. Our travel rates uh, within the Northern state of Georgia were uh, on average far quicker. Uh, they were about 20 kilometers per day through the region. Um, and we see here in this plot, uh, our rate in the Y axis and along the X axis here is the, the week of the year. So starting in about June and running all the way until mid September here, we do see a trend of um, increasing travel rate through the region. And this really just points to the fact that these fish are um, uh, progressing in their in their maturation and they need to get back to the river. Uh, understanding the residence time of Chinook within these regions is, is important both ecologically and in the creation of survival rates. So these residence time were broken up into the Discovery Islands and the Northern Strait of Georgia. And these plots show the residence time among these regions and as we saw with those travel rates uh, as we'd expect, the residence time in Discovery Islands is, is quite a bit longer than that within the northern strait of Georgia. And the only population that I really want to point out here that, that really stands out, of course, is this um, Harrison stock here and the uh, Squamish fish down in the northern strait of Georgia. Uh, uh, these individuals appear to be transiting really soon uh, or really quickly through the region, but they, uh, they have a summer spawning timing, whereas the, the majority of the other stocks here are actually fall spawners. So they're obviously uh, uh, ready to spawn and, and moving through the region quite quickly. So of course, uh, mortality estimates is really what this uh, project is all about. Um, but I really want to draw your attention to what, what we're seeing today uh, is not strictly fisheries related mortality. We're looking at the total mortality uh, of these individuals, which is a combination of natural mortality occurring in the region and the fisheries related mortality. So natural mortality consists of things like disease, predation, uh, effects with competition and environmental conditions. And in terms of our understanding uh, with our telemetry tracking, uh, even, even problems like straying, uh, or, or unreported captures uh, look like individuals that simply uh, die within our system, but they may just simply be uh, doing something odd in terms of migration or not being reported by, by an angler that captured them. And just a reminder, FRIM uh, is composed of avoidance, uh, escape, depredation, uh, mortality occurring on board, uh, or simply a, a dead on arrival fish, uh, and then both short term and delayed post release mortality. But remember, just these, uh, these mortality estimates are total mortality. We, we were not at the point of understanding what specifically is related to, to each component of this equation. So, in terms of our survival analysis, we, we used a Cormac Jolly Seabrew or a CJS model, which is a spatial mark recapture model uh, that accounts for detection efficiencies at our various arrays. Uh, and this first group of results today is a model average result from a, 
a, a, a test to look at the, uh, the impact of treatment. And we only uh, are looking at our, our three largest population groups, those Qualicum and Puntledge fish, the Squamish tributary fish, and the Lower Fraser tributary fish. And again, like our residence time, we're breaking this up into segments or our, uh, migration segments, uh, the Discovery Island segment and the Northern Strait of Georgia segment. But to begin with here, uh, again, you'll, uh, in this bar plot here, we see our survival estimate uh, in the y-axis and our Discovery Islands um, uh, segment of, of migration here in the, in the X and our various population group. So among all populations, we see about 80% uh, through this 80% survival through this region. Um, and when we look uh, further uh, to the south, we see again a, a, about 80%, but a slight decrease uh, and a little bit more variation among the, uh, the two groups. I can't stress enough here that this is our total mortality. So we need to begin to uh, dive into our data and, and start mining uh, for uh, the potential causes of, of this mortality that is, is outside of natural causes and um, try to explain what fisheries interactions may be leading to, these, uh, to, these, to this mortality. Something uh, that's early on has been uh, uh, showing a strong relationship to uh, survivorship. This uh, unfortunately very exciting table here on the left is simply a, a model ranking table uh, looking at AIC or Ikeiki's information criterion. And what I just wanna highlight is that all of the top performing models, uh, these, these uh, models with the lowest AIC values that you see here include eye damage in some form or another. Uh, various other metrics we tested for and, and, and took observations for uh, were not showing up. Uh, uh, in or not showing to be as, as strong relate, strongly related to our data. And when we look at that in terms of survival, we, uh, we see our, our group here with no eye damage in the Discovery Islands, how that compares with our group with eye damage. Uh, there's a pretty stark contrast between the two. Uh, and as we progress through time and space into the Northern Strait of Georgia, um, we see that overall decrease as we'd expect of, of survival, but we actually see the separation between these two groups uh, increases by a couple percent here. So uh, this appears to be indicating that this effect is increasing over time and as these fish continue their migration. So a quick summary of our 2020 results here. Uh, we know the majority of the stocks uh, that we encountered were East Coast Vancouver Island uh, and of hatchery origin. Um, we observed greater residence times within the Discovery Islands than the Northern Strait of Georgia, and that travel rates within the Northern Strait of Georgia appear to increase through time. Our total mortality, uh, these are our first estimates of mortality for Chinook in this region. Uh, they range uh, around 20% uh, for both the Discovery Islands and the Northern Strait of Georgia. And the detection periods occurring within this region are anywhere from six to 145 days. And we know survival probability uh, does appear to be reduced by the presence of eye injuries and uh, this effect increases across migration segments. But we still, we still need some refinement to our work. Um, this first point here, that I say that handling needs to be reduced and intensified, which is a bit confusing, but um, we, we didn't see uh, any impact of our, our treatment on these individuals. So we need to push our treatment uh, further, uh, increasing our air exposure times to really look for that threshold of, of uh, uh, stress and uh, that causes this mortality. Um, but we also need to reduce our handling because our, our, our scientific sampling procedures may actually be uh, masking some of the uh, important factors and uh, that, that's involved with uh, the fisheries encounter of, with these individuals. We need to uh, deploy uh, terminal arrays in our East Coast Vancouver Island systems, the big qualicum, little qualicum and the puntlage. We saw so many individuals heading back there that uh, placing receivers in these rivers would be very, very advantageous. I want to try and find a way to reduce the subjectivity of blood loss and our uh, fisheries inflicted injuries. So 
hopefully, uh, hopefully people here may, may provide some advice on how to do that. And I'd like to actually collect some video footage of gear strikes. Are there certain gear types that may be um, inciting uh, responses that lead to a higher uh, proportion of mortality? Or is there variation between gear and bait, which is often pointed to in much of the research uh, at bait? Um, it's pointed to in much of the research that bait causes more mortality, but in a, in a trolling recreational fishing sense, this, this might not actually be the case. Um, in addition to the data that we're collecting in the field, our, our partners at the SFI have included a, a questionnaire in their uh, catch log component of the Fishing BC app. Uh, this was this launched last summer, and we were lucky enough to receive a total of 628 entries from public anglers using the app. Uh, this was for both Chinook and Coho throughout the summer. Um, and we collected information on various handling behaviors. And these questions were, were based on um, or were informed from a lot of the work from Patterson's Frim paper. Uh, and I just want to highlight this here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of this data uh, here today, but uh, please, if you're, if you're out there this summer or if you have friends out there this summer that are angling, really um, encourage them to use this because the more data we can collect here, uh, the, the, the better it'll be. Uh, and in 2021, we'll be, as I said, we'll be expanding our work into Barclays Sound, uh, starting there sometime in mid-August and, and, and wrapping up sometime in mid-September. Uh, I'd like to introduce the newest member of our catch and release project, uh, Katie Zinn. She completed her master's with Jordan Rosenfeld. Uh, she was studying the Salish Sucker and Juvenile Coho in the Fraser Delta. And as you can tell, uh, she's, she's very excited about fishing. So we're lucky to have her on board, but uh, we have a really cool opportunity in, in the Barkley Sound to uh, uh, target the uh, Robertson Creek fish that are in really, really high abundance here relative to other stocks. So any of our work, we, we don't really need to worry about the, uh, the, the population effect and how these, these impacts might vary among them. It's also a great system because of the uh, fishways at the stamp and SOMAS falls. Uh, this allows us the use of pit tagging technology to uh, track their successful migration into the river, as well as uh, our ability to resample these fish in their spawning grounds or at the, the hatchery themselves. Uh, we can complete uh, genomic resampling uh, to look at how these survivors have varied uh, uh, among uh, our capture and handling groups and, um, and among the groups that uh, made it there successfully and did not. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Uh, please reach out uh, if you don't get to ask questions today, uh, send me an email, stephen.johnston at ubc.ca. And I'll finish things up here with a quick animation just to really provide you an understanding of what we're looking at in these migrations. Um, here is a, a, a video uh, that provides the, the Chinook migration. You'll see these orange dots throughout the map are our receivers. Uh, the Chinook will start to populate in the various, um, the various stocks have, have different icons. Uh, and we have our, our time ticks by in the top right hand corner here. So I just wanna note if you see a star, that's the last known uh, location of that individual. It's not necessarily their point of mortality, it's just their uh, point of mortality within, within our system. We see a number of fish actually from the uh, Chilliwack system migrating south uh, all the way down to uh, nearly Victoria. Uh, we can't see that on this specific uh, animation, but you'll actually see them migrate right back up into the Discovery Islands uh, where they uh, reside for weeks to months, uh, uh, additionally prior to making their migration back south and successfully entering the, the Fraser River. And, and one of them was recovered at the hatchery. Um, again, you'll notice a fair amount of residents within the Discovery Islands themselves, whereas the time spent within the Northern Strait of Georgia appears to, uh, tra the transition appears to be happening a lot quicker. So whether these two regions are uh, acting uh, differently uh, ecologically or not, um, uh, we're going to dive into that a little bit more uh, in the future, but uh, it's a pretty fascinating tool. It's online now at Kintama.com slash visualizations, along with our work from 2019 and uh, numerous other studies that Kintama has been 
uh, a part of. And thank you very much to them for uh, uh, completing these animations for us. It's a really powerful tool. So with that, again, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Scott.